Tonight, a light aircraft crashes near Dunedin. And we meet a man whose work in conservation and carpet has made him a household name. Good evening. Eyewitnesses say it appears engine failure caused the aircraft accident at Tyree this afternoon. The lightweight plane is a write-off, but its flimsy construction may have been to the pilot's advantage, Mark Price reports. The plane clipped a wire fence and landed in a row of young trees. It was being flown by an experienced pilot, Pauline Hogue, who was bruised and scratched, but apparently not seriously injured, although she was taken to hospital for observation. Eyewitnesses say the plane's engine failed and the pilot was trying to land in a paddock next to the Tyree airfield. You could see that she was trying to attempt to turn to get back in onto the paddock and uh, she just had it going against her really. The wind being behind it just meant that, uh, yeah, sort of just basically... Straight into the yeah. yeah. The 14-year-old French-designed home-built aircraft was a common sight in the skies above the Tyree. The fact that it was very light, made of wood and fabric, may have saved the pilot from more serious injury. Uh, the aircraft itself being wooden and also the fact that its uh, stall speed's low, so she, when she actually hit the trees it would have been quite slow itself. So it mm. would have been you know, just the same speed as, say, coming off a bike at 30 miles an hour or something like that, hitting right. a hedge, so it was the same sort of impact. The Invercargill City Council tonight turned down Mayor Eve Poole's revised rates estimates. After a long debate, the council voted 11 to 1 against the new estimates and recommended instead a 9.38% increase. The mayor had wanted to keep the rate increase at less than 6%. About 50 people spent the day in a fruitless search for a Christchurch man missing in these mountains to the west of Wanaka. The search is being coordinated from the town. Two helicopters searched until dark for 20-year-old Vaughan Chamberlain and the search is to continue at first light tomorrow. Childhood illness is all part of growing up, but there's a handful of youngsters who are at the doctors every week with a succession of colds, flu and other infections because their immune systems just can't cope. And as if continuous bouts of illness are not enough, they face another problem, public ignorance. Maxine Clayton reports. It's hard to believe that Emma Carroll is seriously ill. Two years ago, a common cold could have killed her. <laughs> And just looking at Nick Barr, you'd never guess he suffers from a similar condition. Both youngsters were born with immune deficiency, probably as a result of a womb infection. Doctors identified the condition just 15 years ago, and only a couple of thousand cases are known throughout the world. Monthly doses of antibodies drawn from human blood help Emma and Nick fight disease. The infusions are expensive. Nick's worked out he'll be worth a million dollars by the time he's 40. But the treatment's essential. Emma used to fall victim to every bug and cold in the neighbourhood. She got urine infections that were really terrible. Um, the pain for her was incredible. She got skin infections that overnight would develop into really bad sores. And she also had severe dairy product allergies and got bad colic as well. So if you put the whole lot together, Emma didn't have a good time. And we never had a chance for a good relationship for quite a while. Because what was wrong with her was fairly uncommon and nobody could really diagnose it. Hospital staff are delighted with the progress Emma's made since she started the antibody treatment. Her strength of character, in spite of her years, has helped her through the tough times. But now there's a new threat. Prejudice from the public who mistake the condition for acquired immune deficiency, better known as AIDS. These children have the additional stigma of, of uh, being categorised with the AIDS patients, but both groups really don't have uh, infectious diseases in the, the simple social context. The children actually seem to tolerate it surprisingly well, and I think it's the families and the parents that probably bear the greatest brunt, although certainly at times the children have noticed being ostracised. Well, I feel pretty angry at times because our children through no fault of anyone's have developed these spontaneous immune deficiencies and and really people have got to try and understand what immune deficiencies are about. Dr. Ken's research team are among the world leaders in immune research. In the next five years they hope to find a way of boosting what few antibodies Nick and Emma have through a hormone injection. Last year Emma spent just one month out of two whole terms at school. This year is different. In a couple of months, the antibody treatment will give her enough protection to venture back to the classroom. For Emma, it's the first step on the way to an almost normal life. 
Arbor Day was marked by school pupils today. They planted trees donated by the Conservation Department. Here's hoping they grow big and tall like these natives. At 3 o'clock this afternoon, Half Moon Bay was cloudy with 13 degrees. Invercargill, cloudy, 13. Gore, high cloud but 16. Balclutha, overcast and 15. Dunedin, cloudy, a first for 88, the high of 17 degrees. Palmerston, partly cloudy and 14. And Omaru, fine and 10. Kurau, cloudy and 15, Ranfurly fine and 11, Queenstown, partly cloudy and 7, Wanaka, partly cloudy, 7, Alexandra, cloudy, the low of 3 degrees, and Tayana, sunny and 14 degrees. And the expected highs for tomorrow are Dunedin, 16, and Invercargill, 14 degrees. Almost swimming weather? Well, perhaps not quite. Residents of Winton might think so, though. They're looking forward to using their newly covered swimming pool, which has been the centre of a long-standing wrangle about money and sight. The uncovered pool always suffered from the cold, and it's taken nearly 15 years to solve the problem. Peter Crookshank's been finding out why. On the face of it, a covered community swimming pool is no big deal. But for Winton, it's been a real headache. The pool was built 20 years ago on education board land next to Central Southland College. Like many open air pools in the south, it suffered from the cold. So a cover was the answer. Fundraising for that started 14 years ago. But three years ago, a new committee took over the project and it's had many obstacles to overcome. Because it's a boundary between a residential area and a college pool um, and it's by regulation has to be a firewall. So therefore we're incurring a huge amount of extra cost in, in closing that. The other wall on near the gymnasium here also has to be a firewall. Um, we couldn't get dispensation for this area adjacent to the tennis courts. We, we can't understand why a swimming pool full of water with a steel frame and um, sheet metal cladding would require fireproofing anyway. But that's a, sort of an example of the regulations imposed on us because it's on government ground. The tenacity of committee member Kathy Henderson finally got the $200,000 project underway. This is the Mark IV variety in order to get it cheaper. So um, we're absolutely delighted. We can't believe it. I mean, it's been two years of rock and roll nights, country and western nights, casino evenings, house every Monday night, you name it. If, whatever it is, we have done it to raise money. And it's been a long haul. While the eyes of the world have been on the superpowers in Moscow, here in the south, far from the evil empire, the anti-nuclear campaign goes on. The issue's not an explosive one in Dunedin, but reporter Michael Lynch did discover someone here who's out to make a bang. Nuclear bombs loom large for Bruce Mahelsky. His mother is a psychologist with a special interest in stuffed toys. And Bruce has taken this family fascination into the 80s. Here's a factory in Auckland churning out cuddly bombs for sale. Part of the proceeds will go to the peace movement. There's a Russian bomb, an American bomb, and even Iranian and Libyan bombs. Seem to be selling quite well, particularly the uh, Libyan ones. The reasoning behind all this is to fight violence by taking the mickey out of it. Bruce is a cartoonist, and also lead vocalist in a popular local band called Let's Get Naked. The performances are up front, and the lyrics designed to shock. I want to kill an America. People are sick of the cliches of the 70s. People want a new angle, and I think I'm providing it, even if some people do misinterpret it. Stuffed bombs mightn't exactly be a giant step for mankind, but Bruce Mahelsky feels that in his own small way, he's ready to shake the world. Well, uh, I have the bomb, and I'm prepared to use it. Talk about cuddling up to the bomb. It looks like something our next guest would love. He's also a conservationist, British naturalist and television presenter David Bellamy. He's back in Dunedin to front one of the most ambitious natural history programmes to be made in this country, a million-dollar seven-part series called The Last Ark. Michael Lynch again. <laughs> if anyone can be described as larger than life, it's David Bellamy. He's the same booming through the jungles of Ecuador or pushing through the pile on a carpet advert. And today he was in his element, mapping out his role in yet another conservation program. The last arc is a big concept for local TV. It'll trace New Zealand's unique position in the world's natural history, how everything got here, how man infected things, and how best to preserve what we've got. And already there's a crusading zeal apparent. Two or three times a year. David Bellamy has been saying these things since uh, Botanic Man ten years ago. And 
he's made programs all around the world, essentially saying the same sorts of things. Um, we are products of our own evolution and we've got to get our conservation act together. Here in New Zealand, one has the finger on the button of turning around to the world and saying, go easy, it's a marvellous, beautiful, wonderful world. Destroy the floating ark down here and you've destroyed everything. And that destruction will, you know, go on and, you know, grow apace and the whole world, well, the world is dying. I've just flown down from Britain right the way down. I, I spent some time in Australia and everywhere you go, you are seeing destruction of more and more native bush. Let's use that terrible Australian word, native bush. And uh, in the wake of that is um, desertification, salinification, death. 100,000 people died of starvation today. I don't want to live in a world like that. And I know if we follow the conservation ethic, which is building up in this country and across the rest of the world, then we can solve those problems. And that's what this program's all about. It's saying resources. We may own a bit of land, but we don't actually own the um, landscape or the resources. We've got to manage those resources for the good of everyone. Do you think the farmer having a bit of a squabble with the conservationist is going to take your argument when he sees the programme? Are you going to convince him? Uh, we'll certainly try. I have recently made a film in Western Australia called Wheat Today, What Tomorrow, which simply looked at the fact that 70% of all the wheat belt of Western Australia is now um, uh, unstable about to become a desert yeah. and we said this is the way to go ahead you knit it back with trees and you don't knit it back with useless trees you knit it back with trees which actually provide you know an income for the farmer and this in some ways has turned around the whole of farming thinking over there um, you know because the farmers say come on show us how to do it Tasmania Bobby Gray has just become a greenie he just turned around to the wood chip companies the and to the mining companies and said, you've got to pay us more royalties for these things you're taking away because you know you are not paying your way and no one in this world is paying their way we're still looking upon the world as something we reap harvest from and we put nothing back into that's what conservation is about it's about putting something back in and the best way I wish to God we had as much native bush left in Britain as you have down here because we could start to balance our um, the economics of our landscapes much much more easily we can't we're now having to recreate at the moment I'm doing a project where we're spending well, just to buy the site costs ten million pounds just to recreate a um, habitat which we've lost so the birds can come back in there. You haven't got to do that, you've still got it here. You think we've got a chance? Well, if you haven't got a chance, the rest of the world hasn't got a chance. That's why I'm down here. Very, very excited to uh, you know, work with a team. I mean, it was I, I went and met them all at at um, uh, uh, tea time this morning and we had sandwiches about that thick. Now, sandwiches in Britain about that thick. They may be more royal, but it shows you've got more resources down here. And it looks like he's quite partial to our sandwiches too. Sports reporter Ken Nicholson's been down south again and surprise, surprise, he went to watch a game of rugby. But his days of watching at Rugby Park have changed as he found out when he met by an old mate, Boggy McDowell. G'day, Ken. Hello, Boggy. How are you? Welcome to Southland. Good, Good to have you. Good game today. Promises to be a cracker. Absolute beauty. What's all this? You're a bit pond stuff for rugby park, eh? Oh, things have changed, Ken. Things have changed. Yeah? Yeah, Homestead Stadium we're off to, mate. <laughs> Came prepared, Boggy. Oh no, Ken. We'll see around Ken. see scruff and room on the terrace, eh? Rugby's changed in 1988. We have hospitality boxes now. Well, Mr. McDowell, your seats are ready. Thank you very much, Neville. Uh, Mr. McDowell, your friend. No, it's all right. Ken, that was a problem to eat. Okay. Make allowances. Come in, Ken. Is this is all right, Boggy, isn't it? Look at it. Hey, isn't this glorious? And this is Southland. Right, oh, well, we better have a beer then, eh? And uh, oh, get no, no, watch no, Ken, Ken. Wait up, wait up. Oh, here we go, Ken. Look at this. This is the story. This is the life. Excuse it's... me, sir, your boat? Yeah, Ken, come on. You're uh, out and uh, about now. Not your rough stuff. Lemonade. Thank you. This is the top, top shot off. This is just yeah. the best. Yes. Well, let's have oh, a go. Yes, yeah, yeah, look at this. Tarama and the Blues Boys. Well, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you've treated me pretty well. Um, Thanks, I'll man. treat you. Look at it. Oh, oh, no. I left from last week. Not a Peter Sellers. Oh, oh no. Have a bite. No, no, look, this it's class here in Southland, class. Beautiful bluff oysters. Could you just bring some? Look at these, Ken. Look. Oh. Help yourself. Guaranteed to work. Ah. Beautiful. Mm. Not bad. Not bad at all. That's the one gone, Boggy. Waiter. You, the wee fellow of the triumph, here. 
Excuse me, sir. I'm not the waiter. I'm the executive officer of the South and Rugby Union. <laughs> well, you'll be able to film in on all this fancy stuff here at the park. Oh, certainly. Well, These facilities were provided for people, ardent rugby fans such as yourself, to enjoy the very best environment for watching and supporting the game of rugby. Oh, we're certainly doing that. Ken's not really like that at home. And in Ken's defence, I must say it's the first time I've seen John Boggy McDowell in a suit. Have a great Queen's birthday weekend and a safe one. We'll be back Tuesday. Good night.